morning. It's good to be with you. Um, I was thinking about appropriate ways to preach this morning. I thought one, one way might be to find chapter 31, uh, verse 9 of every chapter in the Bible, because that was the final score of the, of the Super Bowl, 31-9, and just kind of go through it all, right? Whatever, 30, whatever chapter 31, verse 9 says, that's what we're doing, because obviously uh, God uh, wants that, right? We believe he's in control of all things. Um, but I did, uh, I did actually want to show you a cool little video, and it's at the very, it's a little 20-second video. It's at the very end of the Super Bowl. We'd already won the game, and um, I'm just going to show it to you, then I'm going to kind of give you a little context around it. So let's just watch this. Okay, a little crazy there, but uh, so that's number 31. He's our free safety. That's Antoine Winfield. That was his dad. His dad played in the NFL for 14 years. I read an article about two months ago about Antoine Winfield Jr., our safety, who said his dad would sit there and watch the game more and watch the film more than he would. And he would study what his son was doing, right? And he would study and see you know, what he needed to do, the angles that he was taking, where he placed himself. And, and every Monday after the game that they would talk about it. And, and Antoine Winfield Jr. said, you know, sometimes my dad was pretty tough on me, right? He was pretty hard on me as far as the way I played. And I love thinking about how hard his dad was on him in those interactions. And I'm sure he was the same way in college or in high school. Because of that, right? He was hard on him because of what he got to experience there, because he wanted his son to experience victory. And I thought about that in the context of uh, God our Father and Deuteronomy, and why God allows us to be uh, like the Israelites in the desert sometimes. I mean, why would God allow that? And some of us ask that question, and we ask it deeply, and we say, okay, God, what are you doing? What are you actually doing? Tell me there's a reason for this. Um, and so when you, th- when you read the Old Testament, sometimes it's hard to do this, but think of it, Father, loving Father, loving Father who will jump in, you ar- in your arms when you win the Super Bowl, uh, Bowl, Father. And when you're thinking about, okay, he's the Father, God, through Moses, is leading the Israelites where? After Mount Sinai, after they come to Kadesh Barnea, after they see the spies, or the spies are sent up into the promised land, where does he lead them? He leads them to the desert. And that's the context of Deuteronomy. And so I just want to read, if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 8. And we're going to read about half of this chapter. And I want us to think of it in terms of, okay, God, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing in terms of how you are uh, changing us? Remember, Make the equivalent. West Town Church, your, your walk, Israel. Be careful, verse 1, to follow every command I give to you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart? whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you or, nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron 
and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and your gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. What do you do with a passage like this? What do you do? Because some of us say, you know what? We cannot, right? We cannot survive a wilderness, Frank. We can't do it. What do we do with this? What do we know a wilderness is? It's, it's, it's a place that's devastated, right, by heat during the day. It's devastating heat, and there's no shade for it. And then what happens many times is it's very, very cold at night, and there's no shelter from that. There's nothing to eat, and there's a bunch of thorns, and you're very thirsty. I mean, that's what, what the desert is like. And as bad as that news was, later on, and we just finished this book, in the book of Hebrews, here's what, here's what God says to the Hebrews. Do not harden your hearts as you did during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years. You saw what I did. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Do you hear the assumption in that? The assumption is that all through the Bible, Israel was what? Was in a literal, physical desert wilderness. But here in Hebrews, they're assumed to be in a what? In a spiritual wilderness. And so there's a sense in which we have to learn how to deal with being and living in a spiritual wilderness. We don't live in that, obviously, right now. But spiritually, what does that mean for us? Because when you think about the wilderness, the wells of, of a wilderness are not deep enough to hold the water that needs to be held. The groundwater during, I mean, in a desert is not what? It's not great enough. There's some water there, but, but ultimately it's not. And what does that mean? It means that this. If something doesn't come from outside of your life into your heart, you will what? You will wilt. That's what it's saying. If something doesn't come from outside of the wilderness, we will be thirsty. We will die, literally die of thirst. And that's the question that we are all asking. Well, what does it mean? How, how, how do we do with this? Because we do have some water. We are drinking some water right now, right? The things that you have right now, your job, our families, relationships, the prospect of achievement, the prospect of, what, of, of some type of professional success, all those, thing, all, all those things are, are beautiful, they're great, but you know what? They're not deep enough. It's the, it's the groundwater that um, the spigot turns off. It's not enough. Wait, I have deeper wells inside of me to be filled, and I get married, and it didn't fill. I thought that's, that's what I needed, and I got the job, and I hit the number, and I have a bigger well than I actually thought. That's what the wilderness teaches us, is that, look, what, what do we do with this longing? And what do you do when all of a sudden things that you thought were going to be there are, 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 are taken away like your physical health? What, what if you have an injury? What if you have a betrayal? What if you have a financial bankruptcy right now? The things you thought, what if there's a sudden death? We know that the wilderness isn't a place of just simply inevitable suffering that we're going to experience, but also of inevitable dissatisfaction. And there will be a lack of fulfillment. Whatever you've just achieved, and some of you have achieved great things. Some of you have told me, hey, I got in here. 
I just hit this, I got that client. I've never been more financially secure. I finally took a breath. If we wanna take anything as far as application from this, the whole idea of the book of Deuteronomy is this. You should never be surprised by your suffering. You should never be surprised. I don't mean that you, you, you turn bitter or cynical, but I mean it means this. It means that you're unflappable. That when you, when you read the book of Deuteronomy, you're not surprised by the hits, right? You're not surprised at all. Because think about this. You know, when the Son of God came into the world and he began his ministry, what's the second thing after baptism that God the Father did, uh, did to him? You're going out to the wilderness. He baptized him, and he says, the, the dove comes down, the voice hits, a good father does what? Sends you out into the wilderness. So we learn. Jesus is the epitome of Israel. He is, right? He, he is a microcosm of Israel. And so, here's what we know. That we don't get disillusioned, first point. We don't get disillusioned. Disillusionment and hardness don't come unless we decide to be naive Christians. Unless we decide to pretend that, hey, this is what a Christian should experience. And if you're that, then disillusionment and hardness will come. Because it's easy to become a naive Christian. I want to come to a safe place where everyone's happy, right? Let's go to Weston. I'm sure everyone's happy there, right? And that's what they experience here. Oh, no. I mean, hopefully they experience some happiness, of course, but no. In Genesis 29, what do we know? Jacob looks at Rachel, and you're going to look at some type of Rachel in your day, and says, you know what, Rachel? Um, you're going to be my, right, everything. You're going to look at some job. You're going to look at a career. You're going to look at some place you want to live. You're going to look at that and say, if I could have that, that's going to fix everything. That's, that's what's going to happen. And Moses, through God, takes them out and into, um, into the wilderness to say, you know what, there is no well, there is no creek bed, there's nothing in the world that could possibly, what? What we find out is nothing could possibly bear the weight of your hopes and your dreams. And so what do you do with that? Because if you start with this, Proverbs says this, it's unwise, you're living you're living like a simpleton. You're living like those that are naive. You should never be surprised by the hurt that you're going through. You should never be surprised when you have a loved one who has died or is dying. Be surprised by the hurt there. Here's what we know, it's part of it. It's part of what's happening. So, so Paul, Paul gives us this very interesting um, verse here in 2 Corinthians 6, 10, or 6, 9 through 10. He says, look, you're gonna be known yet regarded as unknown. Dying, and yet we live on. We're gonna be beaten, yet we're not gonna be killed. We're gonna be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We're gonna be poor, yet you're gonna be making many rich. You're gonna have nothing, and yet you're gonna possess Everything. This is the paradox of what it means to be a Christian, particularly the, the, the beginning part of verse 10. How are you supposed to be sorrowful and at the very same time rejoicing? That's what this is. That's, that's what God is doing, right? How can we be a church like that? Because if you ask me, I've been to the happy, clappy, shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land, you know, that, that. And then I've also been to the, 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 the churches that are like, Kyrie eleison, you know, just like, whoa, is this a funeral? What is going on here? Everyone's sad. And at that church, everyone's happy. <laughs> this feels a little weird to me. This feels, you know, but we, we've got, you know, you've got joy and you have pain. You got sunshine and rain, right? Who knew, right? summer of 1988, right? DJ Rob Bass and Easy Rock would be prophets. That they would give us the truth. Because it's both, man. And so when you think about that, when you think, okay, what does it mean? Okay, 
how do I begin to understand this life that God will send me, life will be about a wilderness? Because you know what I realize? Um, I have to have the wilderness. That's part of my process. Some of you have told me marvelous stories about being out in the wilderness, what it means, right? And, and, and you think, okay, God, what are you doing? And, and here's what we know is that when we're sent out there by ourselves is that you, what you will not ultimately by yourself be allowed or you will not be able to survive. Verse two, it says this, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert. He led you. He took you into the desert. So what we realize is everybody is going to meet God there. Think about the biblical precedent for that. Jacob, he had his two great encounters with God in the wilderness. The stairway to heaven and what? He wrestled with God. You think about Moses, his two big encounters. He was, had the burning bush, and we know Mount Sinai is in the middle of the desert. You think about Hagar meeting God in the desert. Elijah meets God in the wilderness. Israel now, we know, is taken. Where do you find John the Baptist? In the wilderness. In the history of God, this is where we experience God. Are you okay with that? Are you just running from it? No, I'm not going to engage with that. I don't want to enter into a spiritual dry land where I am thirsty. And God says, no, yet you have to come. This is what we do. Because if not, you know what we do? We do everything in America to what? Make sure our kids have charmed lives. That's what we do. We do everything we can. But here's what we know with people that are chimed, are, are charmed, are shallow. Talk, talk, have a conversation with someone that's never gone through things. One of, the, one, of the, one of the perils of growing up in a Christian home where parents are vigilant about protection is when you interact with them, sometimes it feels a little chintzy. It feels a little... Like, man, this, this sounds a little cliche or too Christian-y for me. What does it mean for us to understand that part of our training is wilderness training? I mean, if you think about the great historical world figures that have done great things, I mean, how many times does, do their biographies start out with, and then when he was or she was 8 or 10 or 12, their mother or their father died, <laughs> right? And what happened? great things because they had to engage in a wilderness that brought something out of them that couldn't be brought out unless what unless you went to the wilderness so how many parents want to sign up for that <laughs> right i'm just going to lose my life so that my kid can be really strong what do you do when god says to the children of israel that god emancipates them so they're free and they finally get to the promised land this is in Numbers. And God says, here you go. Take the land. And what do they say? Let's go back to Egypt. At least now we're taken care of. What do we learn from that? Here's what we learn. Is that though they were legally freed from slavery, right? that God took them out of slavery, the slavery had not been taken out of them. And that's what he's doing with us. He's bringing, he brought Israel to the desert because the slavery, the imprisonment had not been taken out of them. And God says, I want to work that out of you. So let's go into this 40 year, which you would think is just, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just mean. It's sadistic. That's who God is. No, he's not. That desert life um, ultimately is meant to Ultimately, we see desert life is meant to destroy reliance on self, and that's why God brings you there. You can run from it, and you cannot engage with that, but I tell you what, you will be a shallow person, a shallow Christian, and when people talk to you, and you say you've run from the desert, and you've maintained whatever it is, the status quo, they'll be like, okay, wow. And they'll walk away a little disoriented because of you. Not because of what they feel like God's doing, is because... They don't maybe know it, but what they'll feel intuitively inside is that, man, okay, they, they didn't engage with this. They don't want deeper levels. They want to stay up here. And God says, come on. I, I want to show you something that's even greater. Because 
when you understand this and you're out in the desert, what happens? Let's just, let's just walk through this for a second. What happens? You're out in the desert, whatever spiritual desert you're in, and what do you do? You hear the gospel. Jesus says it's like water. It's like a drink, and you hear it. And, and you, okay, this, the, the sheer grace of Jesus was what, his, what he's done. I've given my life to Christ, and you understand that, and you're like, oh, my word, I am a child of the king. This is so good, and you're in the desert. Are all your problems gone? No, they're not. This is what we know. This is the process that God takes us through. Of course not. Are you better? Sure, you are somewhat better because you've received Christ, but are your circumstances? No. And you affirm and say, thank God, thank you God for what's happening. You know what? Even in that moment, very little of your life have you placed on the rock. In, in, when we begin Christianity, very little of your life have you placed on the rock. It's still on sand. And that's what God wants to, wants to begin to change. And so you, you, you realize, okay, here comes the wilderness training and your problems will come. You lose your job, you lose your clients, your kid does something, your parents do something to you, your friends leave you, your boyfriend breaks up with you, you get divorced, whatever it may be, and you think, okay, God, what's, what is going on? And in those moments, after you've received Christ, you, you're shocked. You're shocked at that moment, what? how much you still rely on yourself. And you think, okay, you know what? It's not my, my self-regard is not based on Jesus and what he's done. My self-regard has been based on me, and that's part of the process. And you realize that. And here's what you do. Here's what we all do. You pray. You pray probably a little bit more than you used to. And maybe, you know what? You read your Bible probably a little bit more than before. And maybe you come to church a little bit more, and you take the sacraments a little bit more often, and you think, okay, God, what are you doing? And you know what you do? You go to people, and you get love. You go to other people, and you get some counsel. Maybe you help. You give, them, you give counsel, maybe now probably more than before. But now, in that moment, as you do it, here's what's going to be happening. You're going to be drawing strength. You're going to be living at a deeper level in degrees that you, you, you hadn't experienced yet. And the only reason that you're doing that is because you were in the wilderness. You would not have done this otherwise. And the joy of, in Christ doesn't go away when circumstances go bad, but joy in Christ is based now more on what he has done. And when you learn to connect that, when you learn to connect that, then you become a different type of Christian. Then you drop, right? And where I was in kindergarten, now, man, man, maybe I moved up to upper elementary. That's awesome. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing things I never used to do. I used to always go to the bottle. I used to always go to the computer screen. I used to always go to this epic or love story or whatever it may be to, to calm my nerves. And, and you don't. You don't need that stuff. And so you go back and you pray more. You read the Bible more. And you begin to shift from sand to rock. And what are you becoming? You're becoming the type of Christian that has a perseverance that can say, like authentically, man, I am rejoicing and I am so sad. I am so strong and at the very same time I am weak. You can say that and it does not blow your mind. It does not feel weird for you to say that. I don't have this dichotomy between the one. And you know what's happening is you're becoming mature. And that's what God wants to do to our church. I know that. I, re- I saw this tweet uh, about how beautiful this, this pandemic has been for the church. It lists three different reasons, but it was basically this. So, so we can, hey, you know what? It's just gonna carve away, right? It's gonna carve away the dross and we can really focus on what's important. Like we needed that. This could be actually be grace for us. And so when you look at this, lastly, my question is, is how do we not waste our sorrows and, and use the deserts that you're living in right now to make sure that you bloom? Because ultimately it says in Isaiah that the desert is going to bloom. I mean, that, that's the power of redemption. A desert, a garden, right, is where we're headed. I mean, God made the garden of Eden, and we know, Revelation 21 and 22, we're headed to the garden city. And so here's the question. How, how would God bring blooms up 
in the middle of your desert? How would he begin to do that all the more? Well, what did verse 5 say? I think this is important. It says this, Know then your heart. Know then your heart. Obviously, he would only write that if they did not know their heart. If they really didn't understand their heart. So here's what God says he does. He tests you so that you can know you. So God will put, through you tests, put, put you through tests, and he'll put me through tests, and that's ultimately, you think that might be mean. Why would someone test somebody? Well, that'd be some, to, cut something, cut, to cut somebody out, right? To, 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 to sift through some people, to get rid of the weak Christians because he doesn't want to work with you? No. I mean, what do we know? Is that a good father and a good mother, they look down and they see weaknesses in their kids their tests that they put their kids through, sometimes intentionally, and they, they want to know what? They want to know what bar to set. So they set it arbitrarily, and they see if their kid can jump over it, because they want to know what? They want to know where their kid is. More importantly, they want their kid to know where their kid is, for real, so that they can know their own heart. And so, as Christians, are we prepared? Are we prepared to take these tests and say, okay, God, I'm, give me the grade because here's what I know you're not gonna do. I know you're not gonna shame me even if I made a really bad grade. It's, it's simply diag- it's diagnostic, if you will, so that he would see it and I would see it and he says, hey, you know what? We're headed here. So here's what we need to do. Here, here's the way your marriage is right here, right? Let me test you in the way you're parenting. Let me test you in the way that you're loving your parents, let me test you in whether or not you'll share your faith in an instance where it's, you're a little nervous. Let me test you in whether or not you're going to be ethical in your business practices. Let me test you in whatever. Not to hurt you, but to help you. That's why God says to us, you need to know your heart. You need to know where you are. And so, when we understand this and you see, oh my goodness, um, here, here's the deal, I, I don't measure up, right? I, I feel like, you know, I'm this way. Here's, what, here's the beautiful thing. After Christ is baptized, he's sent out into the wilderness. And you say to yourself, man, you know what? I have been, I have been hurt in, such, in, in these ways. I'm out in this desert. God, what are you doing to me? Here's what we know. Jesus, in Hebrews it says he was tempted in every way. So that when you think of Jesus, he sent out into the wilderness just like you've been. And he was tested just like you. He had the same circumstances. Have you been betrayed? So was he. Have you been lonely? So was he. Have you ever been penniless? So was Jesus. Have you ever been made fun of or mocked or jeered? So was he. Are you facing the erosion of your physical body and thinking about death? So did he. And when we understand that and realize, oh my goodness, he was tempted and tested in every way. That's unbelievable. But if you leave it there, it's not enough. Because some of you will say, okay, well, he's just an example. And I can't measure up to that. It goes even more. It goes even deeper than that. What if he was in the wilderness, what? What What if he was in the wilderness for you? That he is going to understand the fatherly love of God. And he would understand as, as the one out there that your sor- sorrows are going to bloom. And then you say, okay. He, sa- he says to, myself, to himself, okay, I was thirsty and so are you. But Jesus on the cross, he was what? He was sent into not just the wilderness, but the deepest wilderness. A wilderness that we will never know, that we should know. It's the deepest and darkest wilderness ever and that is utter abandonment by God. And here's what he says to you. Here's what God the Father says to you. I'm going to abandon my son into the deep, dark wilderness that you will never have to experience. And I'm going to abandon him so I will not have to abandon you. I won't. That's what I'm going to do for you. He sent his very son there, his firstborn son there for you so that I would not have to experience that. He was getting what we deserve. He was what paying our penalty And that's what Christianity has said for 2,000 years. And that's the solution. 
when you go into the wilderness and you know you're in the wilderness, here's, here's how you are able to know that you can trust God because you can never, ever say to God the Father, he doesn't love you. Because that's a father who left his very, very own son for you. He said, you know what, Jesus? I'm not gonna send you just to the wilderness that Israel or West Town knows. I'm gonna send you deeper into that total and utter abandonment to experience the effects of hell. And I'm gonna do that so everyone in this room doesn't have to. And so, do I know why you're suffering? Are you gonna get an explanation for your suffering? Probably not. Is there gonna be mystery with what you're going through right now? But here's what you can never say. When you look at this passage, and you look at the whole of scripture, you can never say, God is not there and doesn't love me. And if you have that, if you have that love that he forsook his own son, and yes, there's mystery of how he's using it and why you maybe lost a loved one or whatever, of course, and that's terrible. Those are hard things. But here's what we know, is that many of us say, many, many of us, our minds go to God simply doesn't care. And we can't do that. You can't do that. Because gospel, the gospel says he sent his very son to the depths of the desert, the howling, horrible desert of death and hell so that we wouldn't have to. What do you do with that? How would that change the way in which you act in the wilderness right now? How would that change the way God is training you or disciplining you right now? If simply you knew God was using it for my good because he sent his very son there, but more than that, he sent his son that far and he, he didn't even send me that far because I, I will never die and he loves me this much. Do you trust God with your life? And he says, ultimately, this is, you know, what did, what did Jesus say in the desert when he was with the devil? He quoted from this chapter. You know that, right? This is the exact chapter that Jesus quoted from when Satan took him out into the desert where he said this, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It was this chapter that Jesus quoted when he was out in the desert fighting the devil. What, what did he need to be reminded of? That, you know, that every word that comes from the mouth of God is where I get life. And what did Jesus say on the road to Emmaus to his two disciples when he was explaining the scriptures? Everything, Moses, from Moses to the prophets, everything is pointing towards me and what I've done. What does that tell us? We live on the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where we get. That's where we are filled up. Where are you? What does it mean for us to walk into the desert and not run from it knowing that, hey, here, here's the point. When God brings us out and when God, when we see that, here, here, here's the beauty of the Father. He, won't, he will rejoice with us, right? He will, he will be like Antoine Winfield Sr. that's going to run up to you and jump in your arms, right? Because he's so excited about what he has done, what you have done as his son or his daughter. Let's pray and ask God to work this into our hearts.